and I'll be chairing today's session. You'll notice we've changed the style of our monthly webinars to provide not only two opportunities to hear from experts on road safety and driving for work topics that help business keep their people safe, but now also to provide an opportunity for our community to share what works for them and the move to teams has made this possible. I'd like to take a moment to mention Don Thompson and Eve Devlin, who along with myself support and develop the Scorsa community towards making their contribution to the target set within Scotland's road safety framework to 2030. Please note that today's session will be recorded and made available through the Scorsa website in due course. We're delighted to be joined today by Michael McDonnell, Director of Road Safety Scotland, and Lou Riff, Europe Society and Public Affairs Manager at Diageo. The first presentation will be delivered by Michael, uh, who will be known to many of us uh, today on the on this, this session. Uh, Michael began his career as a primary school teacher before gaining a diploma in theology and a degree in divinity. His career in road safety began as a local road safety officer with Strathclyde Regional Council before joining ROSPA as road safety manager uh, in Scotland. And it's from that period of time that Michael and I have worked together on road safety related uh, content. Michael was indeed the longest serving member of the Scottish Road Safety Campaign before taking up the post of director at Road Safety Scotland in 2004. One of his earliest contributions to the new role was to change the name of the organisation from the Scottish Road Safety Campaign to Road Safety Scotland in 2005. Michael is an advocate of lifelong learning approach to road safety education based on the fact that types of attitudes and behaviours which young drivers exhibit, and think about that last part of my sentence, are laid down at a very early age, probably before they leave primary school. So I'd like to invite you, Michael, just to give us an insight into uh, the, the challenges that we still face within a Scotland context uh, in relation to drink driving. OK, Karen, uh, thanks very much. I'm going to have to make an apology in advance. You should probably never do that, but I've broken a finger and I have to go to the orthopaedic clinic this morning. So as soon as I've finished, I'll be I'll be running off. But more than happy to take uh, uh, any questions immediately afterwards, and then if there's any further follow up uh, by email. So really, what I've been asked to do is just kind of set the scene in Scotland. So uh, in true presidential uh, form. I decided to call this the state of the nation and over the next uh, three or four slides just going to look at where we are in Scotland in terms of you know what the situation is uh, what havoc uh, drink driving causes in our roads and then a little bit about what we are trying to do to address that so next slide please Neil thanks we just look in in terms of of numbers um uh, 3137 uh, riders or drivers were breath tested that's it's about 52% of motorists involved in accidents. Now, there is a commitment to breath test everyone that's involved in an accident, but that's not always possible, and, and the reasons for that will probably be quite obvious. But of those, 4.2 were positive or refused, so you know that's still a significant number. Uh, and as you probably know, that in this country, if you, you are refused to take a drink drive test, then you are presumed guilty. So um, if you refuse to take a, a drink drive test, then you are uh, presumed positive and will be uh, processed accordingly. Just in terms of age, it's mostly the 35 to 59 year old group. But if you look at it uh, simply in a head of population, then 17 to 25 year olds are the most represented and then 26 to 34 year olds. So it still seems to be an issue among the younger population. Next slide, please. I think the other interesting thing that, that always crops up for me is the time of day. And you would think that, well, when are most people likely to be done? Is it when the pubs open or when the pubs, sorry, when the pubs close or is it in the early hours of the morning? And as you'll see from this slide, there's a significant number are uh, uh, happening, you know, between the hours of 12 and 6. So that's the, the biggest period of, of time when these things are actually happening. So that would suggest that it's not about the pubs closing, it's maybe about people who are prepared to take a drink or for whom drink is part of their lives and it's just as is driving and it's just the, the fact that the two of them come together uh, quite significantly at those particular times of day. And I think the other thing that's that's most interesting is when you look at the at those times of day, this is the time of day when schools are emptying, when work 
surrounding and everything, and possibly when there is a greater risk to people, particularly young people, on our roads. Next slide, please, Neil. Casualties are not a hard fact. So we do know that the number of fatal accidents, uh, a serious accident, slight accidents, and the total accidents are as recorded on the left hand side of this uh, screen. So 230 the total accidents involving illegal drink drive limits. The number of casualties is an estimate, uh, largely because it's not always possible to breath test everyone. So people who, for example, have died at the scene or died later on may not be breath tested. So so the DFT produces an estimate of the number of uh, casualties. But as you can see, still in 2019, um, decades after the drink drive legislation was introduced, we've still got 20 people die in Scotland and a further 90 are seriously injured in drink drive accidents. And that's pretty unacceptable. Um, so 350 people in 2019 uh, were injured as a result of someone who had uh, been drinking and driving. Uh, so again, not particularly good. In terms of what we're trying to do about it, well, we work very closely with Police Scotland. Next slide, please, Neve. Um, and we try to support uh, their campaigns. We know from uh, previous research that's been done that high profile enforcement uh, accompanied by high profile campaign activity is the best combination to try and, and deter people from drinking and driving. So the last three campaigns that Police Scotland Scotland have run uh, have included not just drink but drugs and unfortunately and apologies for this but the, the system that the police use to record uh, crime is not up and running at the moment and therefore it's been difficult to separate the offences so on the right hand side you will see the combined offences which include drink and drugs um, whereas uh, uh, we're able to to uh, separate the um, the, uh, the drink and drugs ones, sorry, we, the, the, the middle figures, apologies, the middle figures are those that were tested. So 427 were tested for drink, 75 tested for drugs and so on. And, and the most recent one, um, 585 tested for drink and 152 tested for drugs. You will see that, uh, not surprising, the festive campaign produces the biggest number of tests and the biggest number of offences. But unfortunately, they weren't able to separate the drink from the drugs, so the offences you see in the right hand side is a combined total. Um, the, the problem we have with drugs, and I'm sorry, drifting into that for a moment, Karen, is that um, when the labs that were set up to process the new uh, drug driving offences um, that Police Scotland were, were recording through the new uh, roadside drug test, um, a lot of those labs were given over to uh, COVID um, testing. So that means that we don't have full results for drug driving yet, but we do anticipate they will come in the near future. And I think that my understanding is they will probably be at least as bad as the drink drive figures, if not worse. So that's something else that we're going to have to consider going forward. Next slide, please. So in terms of our own campaigns, our own campaigns have been focused largely on the younger driver, as you know, when I, my earlier slide talked about the head of population is largely young drivers, and these campaigns are, are, are where we have ended up uh, working. So the grand execution, while not everybody might like it, and I wasn't a big fan of it myself, it continues to score really, really well among the target audience. Um, and this is the type of image we've been using, um, young drivers, uh, may not take advice from a lot of people, but one of the people they do kind of listen to is their gran. And so any of, of our campaigns we have uh, used in the recent years have been using this uh, gran execution. Um, and we've done it across multimedia. Um, so using everything from television to cinema to digital uh, and have a substantial presence in social media as well. Um, and, and so that's roughly the, the kind of state of the nation, as I was saying, in, in terms of where we are with drink, and drug, drink driving, sorry, the numbers, the deaths and what we're trying to do about it in Scotland. Uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty much a, a snapshot of it. I think much of the, uh, the negative publicity in recent years has gone down to the fact that although we changed the drink drive limit in Scotland, um, 
that hasn't had much effect in terms of, of deaths and serious injuries uh, when we compare it to what hasn't happened down south. But I could have a next slide, Neve. I think the, the fundamental reason for us changing the drink drive limit in Scotland largely was based on the North report from 2010. And so people who are drinking over the drink drive limit, um, uh, are, sorry, when people are driving over the drink drive limit, individuals are six times more likely to die. And I think that's a, a kind of line I wanted to leave on screen just to finish with, because it is still an issue. It is something that we need to continue to tackle, and I think we should be in the future looking towards as near to practical zero as we possibly can. And that's me, Karen. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Michael. Um, I just wondered, um, uh, Philip Melson's asked a, a question in the chat about um, having a, a and, and there's a lot of people who who dial into the these these meetings have. Uh, members of staff in different parts, different geographies of the UK. And there's a question just to ask about um, if there's any significant difference between in findings between Scotland, England and Wales and perhaps also Northern Ireland in terms of the numbers, the proportions of people uh, involved in, in drink driving. Again, it's not it's not information I have to hand, but certainly if I, I can find that out and, and feedback to you. Um, but uh, my understanding is that when the, the research was done, it suggested that the that changing the drink drive limit in Scotland had made no difference. Um, so I would anticipate that our figures probably are much different from England and Wales, but more than happy to dig out that information. Yeah, well, that, that would be excellent because we're always emphasising the fact that, you know, whilst uh, the Scorsa project is funded by Transport Scotland, we certainly want the messaging that we develop and, and share to go far beyond any geographical boundary. So um, thanks very much indeed for that. And I wonder just uh, just very, very quickly, uh, part of the Road Safety Framework to 2030 is ambition is to have a national conversation about the things that save lives. How important do you think getting drink driving as part of that conversation is? I think it's a, I think I think we've done particularly well in reducing accidents uh, and fatalities, serious injuries over the years. The, the, the kind of signing up to the UK national uh, delivery plans, and then for the past ten years, and then now with the new framework having our own in Scotland. I think it's really really important that um, we recognise that. And I hate using the expression low hanging fruit, but if we've done and all the, if we've hit all the easy targets and we've hit all the, the not so easy targets, how are we going to meet the difficult ones? And that means that if we are going to meet these difficult ones, there's nothing can be ignored, nothing which causes death and serious injury. So those 20, which probably will equate to, you know, one in eight or one in nine of our, our deaths in, in this year in Scotland, um, we need to tackle that too. We need to figure out the best ways of dealing with that. So we can't afford to ignore any of them, and especially not well that, that um, is, is responsible for about 20 fatalities a year. Excellent. Th thanks very much indeed, uh, Michael, and um, thanks as ever for your contribution uh, to the work at uh, SCORSA. Um, it's fundamentally important that we engage with business on these topics, and uh, that's the, the logic um, to involve Lou in presentation in her presentation to our network this morning, uh, which takes the the topic certainly on a global uh, scale. Um, and I know you've got to nip off just now, Michael. So um, yeah. do do so safely, and uh, we'll catch much. up soon. Okay, thank thanks very yeah. much indeed. Thank you. Um, bye. Now. Bye. Uh, and I would, if I can continue to encourage people to ask questions in the, in the chat, um, that would be absolutely perfect. And what I'd like to do now is introduce Lou to you. Uh, Lou graduated from business school specialising in sustainability uh, and then spent 10 years in Mexico where she worked as an environmental, social and governance uh, consultant, collaborating with companies such as Heineken, AXA, uh, HBS, HSBC and more. Uh, she joined Diageo in Mexico four years ago as an ESG manager. 
uh, and has focused her attention on positive drinking, including underage drinking and drink driving, hence the connection with Michael's presentation uh, this morning. Uh, Lou has worked with health and academic professionals as well as police officers to reduce drink related harm in the country. Uh, she's now based in Brussels and leads uh, the Diageo communication effort for the European uh, region. So, uh, Lou, we're really keen uh, to hear more from you about the Wrong Side of the Road workshop. I know that when uh, uh, Neve, John and myself had the initial conversation with your colleagues uh, about an opportunity to cascade this workshop across organisations and their supply chains. Uh, we were absolutely, um, that's why you're first uh, on the list for this year's uh, SCORSA webinar uh, selection. So uh, please do uh, give us an insight into Wrong Side of the Road and really help um, businesses understand how they can take a proactive part in tackling what is a global issue. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, let me introduce you to our program wrong side of the road so we saw that definitely drink driving is an issue but what can we do about it how can we prevent this from happening and what we discovered at diageo so diageo pre, uh, premium drinks leader uh, of spirits so brands just like uh johnny walker guinness uh captain morgan just so you know some of our brands um, we've been working on uh, reducing drink driving for many, many years. We've been working with the government, with the UN, with UNITAR, uh, the unit for research and training of the UN, police officers all around the world. And we developed that uh, online platform and that training to really prevent drink driving from, from happening. And we, we see a real power in information and understanding what is going on really when you drink, what are the effects and why does it implies higher risk when you drive and why we recommend zero drink when you're going to drive. So let's discover a little bit about this program, but the first thing I want to invite you and I'm going to put a link in the chat if that's easier for you. I want to invite you to answer a short survey. It's very short, but for us it's very important to be able to see um, measure the impact of our program to make this program better. So what we really want here is for you to answer the first five questions. Leave it open. And at the end of the training, uh, you can answer the last question. So we have a pre and a post that will help us understand if the program is uh, working. How do you like it? How can we make it better? So I'm going to share my screen again. You have here a QR code as well, if it's easier for you. Um, and you have the survey in the chat. So I'm going to leave you. It's pretty quick. I'm going to leave you three minutes. Uh, to answer the five first questions of the survey. Leave it open, please. And at the end of the training, you will have some time to answer the last questions. I will leave you one more minute and then we can continue with the training.
OK, I hope you were able to answer the first five questions. Uh, as I said, please leave the survey open. We'll have time at the end of the training to answer the last questions. Thank you so much. It means a lot for us to be able to measure our impact and better our programs every year. So now let's discover a bit more about Wrong Side of the Road. So Wrong Side of the Road is really a program focused on real stories. We wanted to give testimonials and hear from people, real people that have been through the experience of drink and drive, understanding why they did it, understanding the consequences that they faced after. And we wanted real stories. When we hear about drink driving, a lot of times we we listen to uh, tragic stories and they exist, they really exist. But when we hear such tragic stories, it's easy to distance ourselves from what we hear. So hear those stories, even if they had harsh consequences on people, it was not accidents, including life uh, or death matters. And what we really want to see is that every type of drink driving can lead to harsh consequences. So now we will discover one story and then afterwards um, I will talk a little bit with you about um, what is going on in your body, in your mind when you drink and then you drive to try to understand and demystify a bit more. So let's hear some story. I went for a meal with friends, ended up staying, having a lot to drink and we didn't have any money to get home. My mate just goes, oh, should we just take the car? As she was driving, I was like, oh no, stop. We swap over. And as I go to pull off, her boyfriend in the back says, the police are behind you. As I looks around, I take the wheel with me and it was game over from there, really. When I got into the car then and into the driver's seat, I just felt like I was in a bit of a bubble. I felt floaty, if that makes any sense. But as soon as I knew the police were behind me, I just had my focus head on, but I still felt like I couldn't keep the wheels straight. I felt, I felt like I was all over the road. When they didn't blue light me, um, I carried on driving until we got outside um, her boyfriend's house. The police thought I was going to do like a, a like a runner in the car, basically. So by the time we got outside her boyfriend's house, they blocked me in from the front, from the back and a side. And as I tried to get out to the car, they pushed me back in. I was like, whoa, let me out to the car because I've got, I, you know, claustrophobic and I panic. And at first he was very reluctant, but then he seemed like I was cooperating and he let me out to the car to have some fresh air. They wanted to breathalyze me then because they could smell alcohol, which they did. And I was about three or four times over the legal limit. After speaking to my friends, they said, oh, can she just stay? Like, no, they had to take me in to the police station. So they took me into the back of the car. They didn't handcuff me or anything because at that point I became very emotional, crying. And I was like, oh, please, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I just kept saying to myself, I've lost my license. I'm not going to be able to drive. I was angry with myself for being so stupid. I was angry at my friend because I didn't feel like they tried to help, even though I was the one saying, no, I didn't want to do this. The police, before I left the police station, said you'd be sent a letter for when court, a court it is. And I believe it was um, about five or maybe a, um, seven days later that um, I was actually on in court. It was horrible, absolutely horrible. When I spoke to the solicitor, I was just instantly crying. And she was like, can you calm down? Because you couldn't understand me. I was very um, emotional wreck. And I even asked, is there a way I can't lose my license? She said, no, you are going to lose it. I was given a 15 month ban and £250 fine to pay. I wouldn't drink drive again. Never. Peer pressured into it and just stupid. Like I should have just stuck to my guns and said no, but it is hard when people are like, come on, come on, come on. And, you know, but I would never be peer pressured to get into something like that or anything. 
be the best version of yourself you can be. It's not just you that you're thinking of, it's a bigger picture. A little bit huge, big picture. Great. So now let's have a short recap about what we learned from Sam's story. So we learned that she was out with friends and even if they were drinking, they had the, the car and they didn't have money to get a taxi. So they decided to risk uh, driving after drinking. There was a lot of peer pressure involved here to drive the car. Um, when Sam was driving, she says she, feel, she felt floaty or in a bubble. So she felt different when she was driving. Um, and then what were the consequences? Just facing the police and facing court, when you hear Sam's story, you realize the trauma or the shock that it can be. And she describes herself uh, as an emotional wreck. But also some true consequences um, were that she got a 15 month driving ban uh, that she described as a nightmare because she lost all her independence. So we saw here the story and the consequences. Now let's learn a bit about how to avoid the same outcome. So the first thing that we should know about drinking without even thinking about driving is that all alcoholic drinks, whether it is beer, whether it is cider, wine or spirits, contain a molecule. This molecule is called ethanol. And it is ethanol that will have effects on people's brain. It is this molecule that is in wine, spirits, cider, uh, beer, that will have impact on people's brain. So whatever you drink, um, all, all those drinks will have an impact and will have effects on your brain. What is the impact or effect on the brain? Here, I'll leave you to think about it a little bit. Do you think alcohol is a stimulant? or alcohol is a depressant of the nervous system. So just a quick, just quick thought about that, because before I got to work in Diageo, I really thought that alcohol was a stimulant and it is actually not. Alcohol and ethanol, what is the impact of ethanol on our brains? Ethanol is a depressant of the nervous system. What does that mean? It means that it puts our function to sleep little by little. So of course, when you have one or two drinks, um, the result is that you will feel more relaxed. And this, re this relaxation might make you feel that it is a stimulant. Why? Because you want to dance, you want to talk to people, uh, but actually alcohol is a depressant. So of course, when you think about someone that have been heavily drinking, how do people end up? They will end up sleeping. They will end up passed out because little by little, alcohol puts our brain functions to sleep. So of course, when you think about alcohol being a depressant and driving, you understand clearly why those two can't mix. Because of course, it will double your reaction times. It will delay your reaction time and your judgment. So it's very important to keep that in mind when you when you're going to drink. As I was saying, alcohol puts your functions to sleep. So you you think your motor function, your body, and that's why I was talking about being passed out, but also your brain function. And one part of your brain that alcohol will impact is the frontal part of our brain, which is just right here our frontal lobe. But what's the use of the frontal lobe of our brain? This part of our brain is uh, the part that will drive our judgment uh, or risk management. And this is a part that takes many time to develop. Um, we say, scientists say that it stops developing when we're 21 years old. So now we might understand why in the US, for example, the legal age for drinking is 21, because it's the time where your frontal part of the brain stops uh, developing. And then we also understand why, for example, teenagers are more reckless 
because this part of the brain is not developed fully. So they're incapable of understanding the risk that they will be taking. So imagine now this part of our brain, the part that uh, makes, take you, uh, makes you take good decision, good judgment, is put asleep little by little. Let's say that this part of our brain is kind of a Jiminy Cricket telling us you shouldn't do that because I've seen the consequences in the future. And this part of our brain is completely asleep. So now we understand why when we drink heavily, we can take bad decision. We don't care about the consequences. It's, it's phys physiological. This part of our brain does don't work it the way it should be. That is why we always say, don't, if you think you're going to be drinking, if you think you might be drinking, never take your car. Because when you start drinking, if you drink too much, at the end, this part of your brain won't work properly and you won't care about the consequences. You will be unable to care about this, the consequences. So if you might even might think, you know, after work, um, oh, let's go for an after work drink, just one. I'll take my car, no worries. But you know that this one drink might end up in three to four. Never, never take your car, never risk it. Of course, the peer pressure, and we see that in Sam's story. It's important to stick our grounds when we don't want to drink, even not only for drink driving, but we all have people in our families or friends that don't want to drink at certain points. And sometimes we have the tendency to pressure them. So we invite you really not to pressure people that don't want to drink. We don't know why they don't want to drink sometimes, and we shouldn't put them on the spot, but also for yourself. Because at the end of the day, as Sam said, you know, it's a big picture. It's a bigger picture and you might you might risk other people's lives. And finally, it's important to say that everyone is different and the way we process alcohol depends on many factors. That's why we invite you never to compare yourself to other people because the way you process alcohol will depend on your gender, will depend on your height, on your weight, uh, on, your, on some psychological factor. So don't think, oh, he drank three, so I can drink three. No, we're all different in front of alcohol. Um, also, it's very important to understand that um, one standard drink of alcohol normally takes your body one hour for male and one hour and a half for female to process it completely. So now let's imagine, you know, on a Thursday night, you went out with some friends um, after work and you had too much to drink and you went to bed about one or about 12 and you've drunk maybe 10 drinks. The next morning, knowing that, for example, for me, for a female, it will take me one hour and a half to process one standard drink. The next morning, when I take my car to go to work, I will still have alcohol in my system. So it's very important to be mindful that you never drink and drive even the day after. If you drive the day after and you've been drinking too much, you might still have alcohol in your system. And I want to go back to the zero drink. In Diageo, what we recommend is really if you're going to drive, don't drink at all, not even one drink. And some people might argue, you know, when I drink one beer, I'm fine. I think I can drive. What you really should know also about alcohol is that you never know really how it's going to impact you. And I I will give you an example. You know, um, I was mentioning that alcohol is a depressant of the nervous system. So now let's imagine that you had a horrible week and you're super tired and it's Friday and you're kind of depressed and tired. This one drink, if your brain is already depressed, and you put a depressant on top of it, this one drink might impact you much more than you think. So maybe you think just one drink is fine, but this very day, one drink won't be okay. So we always say never, never drink and drive. And if you're gonna drive, zero alcohol. 
Um, now there are lots more of uh, of zero zero types of beers or spirits uh, that could be um, an option if you still want to celebrate with your friends, but you're going to have to drive. Think about those different options that you can take. So I went rather quickly because first of all, I wanted to give you time to finish the post survey, but more than anything, I really want for you to have time to ask all your questions. Um, while you, so I will please invite you to finish the post uh, survey. So it's the same survey that you start uh, that you started at the beginning. Finish the last question and submit. And in the meantime, I will share with you a bit how we deploy Wrong Side of the Road. So Wrong Side of the Road is a global program. We have it from Mexico to Spain to Thailand uh, to Kenya. And this program can be delivered uh, differently. So the first one is type of this, this kind of Zoom face-to-face -face trainings. That is an option and that we can do in organizations. But also we have an online platform that can be promoted, which will share the same information that I've shared with you today, a bit more condensed. And this platform is completely free and you can use it whenever you want. So this is also a good option uh, for sharing this program within your, your companies and making sure that our roads are, are safer. So now I will stop sharing my screen. I don't know if you have any questions about or drinking drink and drive or the program itself. Yeah, from my um, perspective. Potential here for us to have, you know, to have that conversation uh, with business about how they protect not only their individual drivers, but the drivers' families and also the supply chain, because there are, I mean, Michael gave us some insights there into the age groups that um, fall within Scotland's drink drive statistics. Uh, and we've got an example there that we've just seen that could be, it could be my child, it could be my daughter, it could be a whole array of different um, people in my life that this is relevant to. Um, I've got some comments here. Uh, again, a, a comment from from um, Phil uh, Melson about um, how good it is to see um, a major drinks organisation like yourselves uh, tackling that um, issue and being very proactive. I mean, what what's the key motivator uh, for Diageo here? Yeah, so in Diageo, we have a very strong what we call ESG strategy, so environmental, social and governance strategy that is called spirit of progress. And one key pillar of this strategy is what we call positive drinking, because at the end we want people to drink better, not more. And what we want is really for our product not ever to harm any of our consumers and the protection of our consumers. So for us, it was very important to tackle three main issues that we see. The first one is underage drinking, for which we have a separate program that is called Smashed, uh, very vibrant in the UK. We have a drink and drive, so that's where we have wrong side of the road and also work with local governments and police all around the world. And then we have moderation and reducing harm with empowering consumers on, on information. Just write the, like the information that I've shared with you, what is going on when you drink so you can make informed decision. And we have been working in, in this positive drinking aspect for a very long time. I think I think for me also the 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 way in which you explained the the impact of alcohol on people's systems and particularly uh, towards the end of the session where you said you know if you've had a a busy week a hard week a, one unit of alcohol can have a different impact on your physiology and perhaps your your mental state also and it kind of took me on to thinking about. Um, and I'm interested to know what people uh, who are on, on the session this morning think about, you know, driving tired is becoming almost as unacceptable as drink driving. Um, in my, in, from a ROSPA perspective, 
um, given that we know the links between fatigue uh, and accidents, but that um, the potential So apologies for the, the sort of breakdown there. There's a comment here uh, in relation to um, zero limits. I mean, with your, I think, I think the broadband just, I live in a very tiny village in the middle of nowhere. So I think my broadband just went there. So apologies for the, the sort of breakdown there. There's a comment here uh, in relation to um, zero limits. I mean, with your um, experience on a world scale with this project, are you delivering this project in parts of the world where there is a zero limit? Or what is the, you know, what's the general consensus about drink and drive? What I can share with you is the experience that I had in Mexico, where every every state, uh, it's a federal country, so every state had different limits. And what we were really pushing with uh, with Diageo working with the local government was the zero limits because it doesn't give any doubts. I think it's highly unpredictable how much alcohol you will have. So when you have you don't have a zero limit, people will say, oh, I can have two drinks. I can have three. I can have one when it's zero. It's a lot easier because you know, you don't have any subjective types of feelings that, oh, maybe me, I can have more and me, I can have less. It's just zero. And I think it makes it uh, easier for everyone to really understand the limit and not cross it. Yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, that's something that's been picked up in the chat, uh, you know, that we will struggle to crack this while governments and nations don't have a zero uh, limit, you know, um, and the suggestion is that not having a zero limit actually uh, demotes all this great work and messaging that's been produced by yourselves and also uh, Road Safety Scotland. Got a comment here uh, with respect to question nine, uh, which is to suggest, you know, that there might be a not applicable where people wouldn't drink and drive, you know, so there is that inbuilt thing where you just wouldn't okay. have that quick drink at lunchtime or that one drink where uh, we've recognised this morning that can have uh, quite a, a sort of significant impact. Um, and we've got questions here about how we can share the platform, you know, so the free training yes. uh, and make sure that it, it does uh, get disseminated as a consequence of today's uh, event. Would that be something we would share via the SCORSA website, for example, or would it be a via yourselves? Yeah, of course. I can share it with you in the chat right now, and of, and you can of course share it um, on your platform. Um, so this is the link you can get on the platform. As I was mentioning, it's completely free um, and perfect. free access, which is perfect. And we certainly will be keeping in touch with the people who are part of the session today, uh, Lou, to find out how they use the package going forward because that's really the um, the sort of pre and post is really useful from your perspective, but from a Scorsa perspective, we really want to understand what businesses in Scotland are doing about uh, having had this information from you. There's some reflections here also uh, in relation to uh, comparisons between distracted drive and, and uh, drink drive. And so that's certainly something we can uh, consider going forward because the whole piece uh, with Scorsa is that we can take these themes that arise as a consequence of these types of conversations and embed them into the programme as the year uh, un, uh, evolves. I've also got, I can see, uh, drug driving is very prevalent, uh, mentioned by Melanie. Uh, so drug versus drink and or distracted driving would certainly be good uh, comparisons to make. Um, I'd like just to um, ask the, the floor at the moment, you know, if, if you're sitting there thinking about uh, other topics that you'd like us to cover 
uh, going forward. I'm thinking that from a Scorsa perspective, I'd like to be back in touch with you, Lou, about um, recording a podcast uh, on this topic and also signposting to these uh, resources. Uh, we recorded a series of six podcasts earlier on this year that um, reflect the safe system uh, of road safety that underpins our uh, road safety, safety framework to 2030. And then four elements about how you plan, do, check and act to manage driving risk as you would any other risk to your organisation. And the final uh, element of uh, the initial six uh, was Michael talking about how we communicate on road safety issues. So um, I think that I would like to pick up with you um, in terms of how we could have a podcast that would bring this together so that people who are, you know, walking to work or, you know, just taking that time out, just different ways of getting to the same uh, audience. And again, Phil, thanks for mentioning uh, the, the role of break uh, in promoting road safety uh, also. Um, are there any other questions that anyone would like to pop in the, in the chat at this particular moment in time? I'll just give everyone a, a moment or two to to consider that. Is there anything else you would like to ask this audience, Lou, while you have their attention? And I say it's a very rapt attention you've got uh, for this topic, which we're hugely grateful for. Is there anything else you would like to know from them? Um, we're more than anything, uh, just saying that we're happy to support any initiatives. We know that sometimes trainings in organisation can be complicated. But we really think that those types of topics can touch anyone and can really have a huge impact on employees' well-being. So um, any any questions on uh, on or anything that uh, that like to implement on Drink and Drive, and we also have another website that I'll share with you that's called Drink IQ, and it's more about. Um, it's not on drink and drive, but it's more about moderation and understanding what are the effects of alcohol when we drink. Um, and I think that also can be interesting for um, for employees. So I'll share that with you as well. That's absolutely perfect. And what we'll do, I'll work with Neve to make sure that these links are available through uh, the Scorsa network. We'll certainly pick this up uh, in terms of making the recording available. Uh, on the Scorsa website and we'll make it available through um, the Scorsa newsletter that'll be coming out in a few months time. So uh, if I can just say thanks very much indeed uh, to yourself uh, and Michael for your making yourselves available uh, this morning uh, to allow people just to take that moment to think uh, about topics for the next series of Scorsa podcasts. Uh, I'm already thinking about active travel, electric and autonomous vehicles and certainly something on uh, drink driving, working with yourselves. Um, in terms of other opportunities that are available to the Scorsa network uh, currently, uh, we've been researching ways to help combat the issue of rising fuel costs and certainly eco driving is very much uh, the, the talk. Uh, of um, many of our uh, members at the moment and how we can look at reducing fuel uh, consumption and reducing the overall cost of fuel for your business. So we do have uh, access to an eco driving safety program uh, that's that's available. Uh, we can provide that free of charge uh, to SCORSA members. Um, we have we can offer this to 10 organisations within the, um, the the project budget that we have available at the moment. So uh, I know that 50% of those organisations have already come forward. So please do uh, think about um, getting in touch with Neve regards uh, the Eco Drive and Safety Programme, and we can ac we can provide access for 10 of your drivers uh, to undertake the programme. The only uh, caveat is that we would very much want uh, the organisations that are involved to share their experience. Uh, so that we can encourage others to take that step forward. So uh, please do uh, contact info at scorsa.org.uk. Um, lots of very positive responses. I knew there would be, Lou, uh, to your presentation this morning. Um, if I can flag up our next session uh, of the Road Safety Hour, 
uh, is available on the 20th of September and our focus will be post crash response. So what organisations should be doing and how we're supported by our emergency services. Uh, and for those of you that understand and know how the safe system uh, fits together, post crash response is one of the key elements. So uh, please keep an eye on our Twitter feed uh, and we hope to see you then. So thanks very much and goodbye for today. Thanks everyone. Have a good day.